star of a hit. Imagine being Afghan American and an actress trying to get work in Hollywood even after 9-11. Imagine this. Azita Ganizada had difficulty, as you can imagine, being offered roles that either weren't terrorists or Muslim related. So when she became the star of a hit show, playing a character, not a cliche, Azita thought, hey, maybe things are changing for her in Hollywood. Yeah, not so much. She is here to talk to us today. Uh, let's listen to a little sound, though. I know him. The roles that I had never had to bend to, even after 9-11, were coming to me more and more. A lawyer but wear a headscarf, a wife but put on an accent, a good Muslim fighting the bad ones. And look, I get it. I'm an actor, and these are roles that actors play. But something was off. That's from her terrific TED Talk. Make it a point to listen to it. Azita made it her mission to fight against typecasting like this. She is succeeding. And Girl is here to talk all about it. What a pleasure and delight and privilege to, to meet you, Azita. So many people have told me that you and I would be kindred spirits, and now we get to meet. This is such a delight. I'm so excited to meet you. Thanks for having me. So, uh, I mean, there's so much to dig into, but I just keep thinking about you know, one of my missions in life is is to address this importance of being seen. And and for, for a little girl, uh, that was such an important thing for you, yet you were told at a very young age, you shall not be an actress, you shall not act on the stage. No was what you heard, yet here you are. Right, I mean, it was funny because, I mean, I guess there were two, two versions of it. One is culturally, as a young girl from Afghanistan, the arts wasn't really something that was respected. Sure. Um, I wasn't really allowed to stay after school and do plays or things like that because I'd be on stages with boys. And bringing shame to the family name was something that everybody was uh, very intense about. So I was told I wasn't supposed to do that. I was supposed to go into things that were more respectable, like a lawyer, like a doctor. I think that's a lot of immigrant stories. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I, I really desperately wanted to see myself on television for some reason. It was like this little tiny voice inside of me. So I kind of... Uh, packed my bags and showed up to Los Angeles not knowing what I was doing, hmm. um, but knew that I had some sort of a purpose in coming here. Well, the purpose has been revealing itself, interestingly, right? Because it, it you know, like many people who come here with dreams and, and stars in their eyes, the reality that awaits you is much different from what you imagined. A and for you, that was encountering stereotype after stereotype. And it got some fire burning in you, girl. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the interesting thing was is that I've actually never really, I've never gotten hired for those roles. For whatever reason, people don't think I look Afghan. They're like, oh, are you European? Are you half? Oh, you must and be no, Latina. I'm fully Afghan. And part of that confusion is that people don't understand that we're not a monolith, right? Yeah. There's so many different tribes in Afghanistan. And just like the entire MENA and SWANA region, we don't all look the same. Right. But the same image is consistently put out there, that we have to look a certain way, that we have certain characteristics that feed in to this kind of othering of us, this exotic, like making us more exotic than we necessarily need to be. So I never played into those roles. But what I learned was, and the reason the fire that was burned into me was that I learned when diversity became important mm -hmm. that I was counted as white. Mm. That Mina and Swana folks, that anybody that looked like me from my part of the world, didn't have a diversity box. And so <laughs> when they were counting diversity all of a sudden, we became even more invisible than before. Man. So that's when all those roles really started to perpetrate. That, that's when all of a sudden I started to get, I mean, this was 2015. I was a decade into my career. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, the only thing I could get was if I spoke another language or spoke in an accent or put on the headscarf. And I I have no issue with any of those things. Sure. I love speaking in another language. Sure. I love putting on accents. You're more I'm than one actress. dimension. Exactly. But it kept on, it, like something was triggering in me. And when I did get a TV show, uh, the studio, the network let me know that I was counted as white, that I was a Caucasian hire. And so I had to let them know that I was Asian, Afghanistan was in Asia. And they were like, oh, well, you know, you don't have a a group like the NAACP fighting for you guys as performers. So, you know, maybe you should go out there and start one. And I was like, what do you, wait, what do you mean? We don't, we don't have any, so we didn't have anybody fighting for us as performers. I mean, yeah. I guess we're a relatively new group here in Hollywood. That's definitely what the numbers show us. Yeah. But it was confusing to me that in 2015, no other organization was speaking up for us. No one had done this work. There's a very, you know, MPAC, which works here in Hollywood, 
fights for and focuses on the Muslim, yeah. um, you know, the Muslim uh, narrative. However, we're not all just Muslim. That's and true. We can't continue to only play into Muslim stereotypes or Muslim roles. So that was something that I kind of felt like we needed to change. Well, let, let's talk about that. In fact, since that's part of your work now is, is, is sort of blowing apart stereotypes. It's also informing and educating and controlling your own narrative. Let's talk about Mina and Swana. Mina, Mid-Eastern and African, right? So, so define all of those terms for us so people know. So Middle Eastern, North African is, and Swana, South, Southwest Asian and North African. Swana is like the more current term, but MENA is kind of what we've historically been known as. Mm -hmm. So MENA was something that the U.S. Census was rolling out as a potential new category for mm -hmm. 2020. Mm -hmm. And this year, my organization partnered with the census to try and kind of push that forward, but we didn't get that box. However, we did get the ability to start writing in where we're from so that we can actually be correctly counted. Yeah. Because we're not even correctly counted. It's something I tell about all the time they're like oh you're only one percent of the population i'm like we're in the white box right <laughs> How can you actually know what we are right. um but middle east north africa is everything from like egypt to saudi arabia to palestine to um Mor morocco uh all the way up to afghanistan yeah. um iran turkey armenia all those countries so it kind of like is that entire region of the world where we kind of all play the same storyline. And the reason why it's a little bit different in Hollywood is because it's not necessarily, it's 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 by what you can play. Right, so it's what right. you're identifiable as. So right. that's the MENA region. So, but a huge win, MENA is part of the Academy's new inclusion standards for Hollywood movies to qualify for an Oscar. I mean, look at the smile on your face, like you're <laughs> ecstatic. I couldn't believe it. Honestly, I felt like I finally won my Academy Award. This is incredible. Um, it's it's massive like you have no idea for us to be included in their inclusion and hiring practices for the 2024 standards is insane like we've never had that kind <laughs> of representation I mean that's the gold standard in Hollywood yeah, so all yeah. of a sudden all these producers are like well oh you know this person does count towards those standards she is this it might give you a tiny little bit of a you know, a step up, yeah. but you know, most of those standards and practices, that's kind of what's going on in Hollywood already. Yeah. I mean, according to like USC Annenberg, I think 90 out of the top 100 films, and, and I'm not 100% sure of that statistic, but I think 90 out of the 100 top grossing films of 2018 already met most of those standards. So films are kind of doing that because audiences want to see people represented. You know, they want to feel like they're seeing themselves and Actually, movies with more diverse casts have the best box office turnout. Yeah, they and absolutely do. Well, look, movie. representation matters. We talk about it all the time on this on this broadcast and why it matters to control your own narrative, to tell your right. own story. This is what Azita is about. And Azita, this I feel like was the appetizer course for conversations that we're going to have in the future because we never have enough time. It's, it's one of the perils of television. But I'm so glad that we got to talk about this today. Uh, and I look forward to further conversations with you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's so wonderful to have your allyship. I mean, it's been, like I was saying before, women of color that have come before me and others that are really kind of blazing that path. And so we're not here without people like you. So thank well, you so much. I've lived in that little white box that said other for mm, all my life. And You uh, get it. You I know. Get it. I do, honey. <laughs> I do, I do. If you want to learn more about Azita's organization, go to minaartsadvocacy.com. Thank you so much, Azita. Good to see you. Stay safe, darling. Thank you.